Hello, uh, this is Bernard Bars. Um, I am uh, putting together a couple of different uh, software uh, elements to uh, be able to present this to you uh, in spite of uh, being persecuted by uh, thunderstorms in Virginia uh, so that I could not use the regular uh, ways of uh, having connectivity because the power was out. In any case, um, that is now uh, more or less solved. Uh, since I've moved out of that area and there are no more power outages. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen Harnad particularly for doing the tremendous job of organizing the first summer school in consciousness uh, and in particular in this scientific study of consciousness uh, and in particular particular uh, in the evolution uh, uh, and uh, biology of consciousness. So this is a, uh, a notable event. It's a historic event because, of course, we are getting back to consciousness after almost a hundred years of taboo uh, against uh, studying consciousness the way um, people in science uh, would study any other topic. Um, I usually think that uh, barging straight ahead and uh, finding some evidence that has a bearing on the topic is probably the best way to tackle a uh, enormously difficult and challenging problem like this uh, rather than simply uh, discuss it in the abstract. So uh, my uh, topic is the biological basis of conscious experiences and I hope to convince you during this talk that there is indeed a biological basis but that the best way to approach it is by uh, studying the facts. And that is both facts about the brain, facts about the behavioral and cognitive aspects, and of course uh, facts about the subjective experience of consciousness which are uh, the key. Um, and uh, we want to know about that and we have uh, in the history of psychophysics uh, 200 years uh, of um, cumulative and very beautiful and very regular findings regarding subjective experience. So we, it's been done uh, and we know how to do it and it's very difficult for certain kinds of cases uh, but in the case of sensory processes it is one of our best sources of scientific information uh, under the heading of psychophysics. So uh, that's a little uh, introduction and uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and talk about global workspace dynamics in the brain. I have been working on global workspace theory now for oh since 1980 roughly um, when I started at UC San Diego uh, at a postdoc and working with people like Donald Norman um, and George Mandler and a number of other uh, interesting people. I've benefited a great deal from interacting with a number of uh, wonderful scientists over the years and I'm, I'm appropriately grateful uh, to them as well as philosophers of course. So the biological basis of conscious experience, global workspace dynamics in the brain. Uh, and please go to slide number two. Um, the limited capacity paradox is uh, something that people have studied now for more than a hundred years. Um, and it continues to be a puzzle uh, because we have this extraordinary limited capacity. Nelson Cowan and his colleagues uh, estimate that the conscious contents uh, are estimated at about one item at any given time to a maximum of four items at any time. Uh, and of course this is still uh, carefully debated. It's, it's been worked out in extraordinary detail uh, with great care. And the implications are if we have that kind of limited capacity um, then uh, these are our ancestors in a wonderful movie uh, with French actors and dancers and so on uh, playing our rather hairy looking ancestors and in the case of the young girl in the middle uh, a slave they uh, they took from uh, by raiding a neighboring tribe uh, these were not nice people uh, they were pretty um, pretty basic uh, and now they're running away from some kind of creature changing them, which is uh, something they did a lot uh, because human beings are very vulnerable 
to big animals with big teeth and big claws and uh, poison and uh, uh, fangs and so on. So in this particular case, they're being chased by a lion. Uh, and in Bambush, uh, there is a snake. Now, this is not unusual. This is uh, uh, quite normal in a, a natural environment uh, that there are uh, ambushes. Uh, animals ambush each other all the time. Predators ambush prey in particular. And sometimes if you see uh, cats playing with each other, for example, you see them ambushing each other uh, in a playful way. Um, they would not use that to kill, but that is also a rehearsal for killing prey, and human beings were luscious prey because we don't have natural defenses. We do have tools, as you can see. Uh, in any case, uh, now, uh, that the limited capacity paradox applies to conscious processes, I want to emphasize that, but not to unconscious processes, which are huge. And going on at the same time, we have hundreds of automatisms, perhaps thousands, probably thousands, and we have hundreds of, uh, and we have many, many processes taking place in parts of the brain that do not support consciousness, such as the cerebellum being the most famous case, um, and so on. So there are lots and lots of unconscious things going on. Uh, these people, as they're running, are probably mostly making use of unconscious processes but it's the conscious ones that will kill them uh, because it's the conscious ones that are limited in capacity and therefore make them vulnerable. Um, and, and that is the limited capacity paradox in its most, in its rawest biological fashion. Uh, so with that kind of limited capacity, how did you and I ever get here? Uh, it's uh, very likely if it's a uh, dysfunctional adaptation, uh, it's very likely that we would never have gotten here. Uh, we're talking about 200 million years of mammalian evolution, where we know that limited capacity of conscious contents uh, is a very important issue. Uh, and so, so the question is, uh, how did we ever get here? Uh, and my answer at the bottom of this page is, we wouldn't have gotten here, limited capacity is so narrow, even though we have a huge brain with vast numbers, uh, about 90 billion uh, neurons, with trillions of synapses between the neurons, and with uh, um, huge uh, memory capacity that probably uh, includes a uh, vast number of episodic memories that reflect our conscious experiences. Uh, so it's, it, all those capacities are enormous, uh, and there are many other large capacities, but they are unconscious. The conscious problem is the limited capacity. How did you and I ever get here? Well, I don't think we would have. Uh, and so our faithful dogs uh, would have been, uh, uh, you know, mourning our, uh, our the, the, the soldier here in armor who has uh, uh, died. Uh, one way or another. Um, so, uh, so the question is, how could this be biologically adaptive? Well, this question suggests that conscious cognition provides compensatory benefits, and there are many, many adaptations. Indeed, all biological adaptations arguably have pros and cons. Uh, so that uh, if there are uh, drawbacks, for example, we do not have large weapons uh, uh, built into our bodies like the lion does, or like the snake does, or the dog for that matter. Uh, we uh, live on the basis of our inventions uh, and our capacity to think and uh, discover tools and uh, work socially with others uh, in hunting groups and uh, domesticate dogs and any other uh, many, many other adaptations that humans have built, but which are ma mainly dependent upon our cultural capabilities, which are in turn dependent upon the brain. Uh, so, uh, like any other biological capacity, conscious and unconscious events have pros and cons. And in this particular case, you see primate skulls, uh, which are different in size, 
uh, and uh, the one on the right is the human one, if I'm correct about that. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, and as you know, of course, uh, uh, having a large brain uh, by itself has pros and cons, uh, such as the size of the birth canal in human uh, females who need to give birth to babies with large heads, which is a major uh, drawback uh, biologically. It, it's, it, exact, it exacts a high cost, uh, and women uh, still pay that cost uh, when they give birth. Um, so, uh, what's the compensatory advantage that consciousness provides? Well, the claim that I have made and that my colleagues have made is that conscious cognition creates many kinds of access. Uh, access uh, is not just one thing. Uh, the claim here from a 1997 article in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, is that uh, a, a number of different functions uh, have access to each other by way of conscious experiences one way or another. And I will mention a few ways in which that can happen. So, for example, uh, one of the most important aspects of this is that there is uh, access uh, between the uh, what is traditionally known as the observing self or the observing I, which is the input side, in a sense, of executive functions to the brain. These are traditionally called ego functions, and I think we ought to go back to the uh, word ego functions because the word ego means I in Latin. <clears throat> and we are taking, particularly talking here about what William James uh, called the... the uh, uh, the observing self as opposed to the self as the object of cognition and perception. We can think about ourselves, but that's not the same thing as being ourselves. And uh, I follow Immanuel Kant, actually, in suggesting that uh, consciousness involves a interaction between the observing self and the objects of perception. So you don't have consciousness without both of those ingredients. It's a joint function of a uh, observable self-system, observing self-system, sorry, uh, and the contents of consciousness, and, and the potential contents of consciousness, I should say. Uh, other access, uh, there's an uh, access between implicit goals, which are now known which are now verified by experimental tests. Um, a great uh, experimental literature has arisen on implicit goals uh, and voluntary actions so that we know that our implicit goals, which may be denied or which may be simply unknown to us, uh, implicit goals do shape voluntary actions, the actions that are subjectively voluntary and which are controlled by the executive functions of the prefrontal cortex in human beings. So uh, that's another uh, way in which access is, is uh, created, uh, I believe, and my colleagues like Stan Franklin believe, via conscious experiences. Uh, and finally, um, uh, consciousness creates access between sensory input and learning. Uh, which is a hugely important connection that I'll get back to later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the final example I want to give about specifics is from an article by Stan Franklin and myself in 2003 in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, uh, namely that uh, uh, conscious elements can recruit unconscious working memory functions. Now we know by now that working memory is not a box in the brain, that working memory recruits all kinds of uh, distributed uh, functions in the cortex, uh, including the linguistic uh, uh, areas of cortex, both on the right side and left side, the left, tip, left side typically being the production side and the right side being largely um, receptive. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, they work together, of course, if you have an intact corpus callosum, which allows for very fast and very 
uh, wide bandwidth uh, connection between the two hemispheres, interaction between the hemispheres. In normal people, the two hemispheres work together, uh, but the um, but the linguistic component, as you know, especially the production side, resides mostly on the left hand side in most people. Um, so uh, the argument that uh, Stan and I made in 2003 is that the global workspace of consciousness uh, enables and triggers uh, unconscious functions like the language functions. Uh, on the left-hand side of the bottom here, we see unconscious verbal automatisms, um, immediate items in working memory, unconscious items in working memory. Once we are conscious of an item in for working memory, it goes into an unconscious state for about 10 to 30 seconds. Then we can retrieve it but, uh, and bring it back to consciousness. And of course, we have unconscious visual spatial mechanisms in uh, traditional working memory. Uh, we call it, uh, uh, it's been called various things, uh, uh, but uh, the visual spatial uh, component of working memory is one of the things that's traditionally called. Uh, next slide, please. I'm on slide 12 now. Um, so uh, here's a useful metaphor, but it's only a metaphor. Remember that metaphors are not theories, but they are useful. Historically in science, we've used a lot of metaphors. Uh, in this particular case, we have the lady singing in the light, the soprano uh, singing in song. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have selective attention, which is analogous to uh, the controller of a spotlight. And selective attention selects the contents of consciousness in this theoretical framework. There are many, many backstage activities that make it possible for the lady to be singing in the light and for the uh, spotlight to be pointed at her at the appropriate times and for the other actors to come on stage and for the play to work out. All those details have been worked out uh, in the past uh, under the control of the director who is sort of an executive function uh, and any number of other people who are invisible to the audience and it's worth remarking that the audience itself is also unconscious, of course. Uh, so we have uh, broadcasting of the information in the uh, bright light on stage um, that is spread to the uh, unconscious uh, audience of uh, multiple uh, specialized processors. Uh, and uh, as well as um, being spread to uh, the backstage stagehands, directors, uh, spotlight operators, and uh, whatever else you have. Again, it's a useful metaphor for thinking about it, and it's also a metaphor. Uh, slide 13, please. Now, um, in the brain, uh, we have the anatomical basis of conscious content, which has for more than a century been believed to involve the cortex uh, in close interaction with the thalamus. The corticothalamic system is one way of talking about it, or the thalamocortical system. There are people who argue for one or the other. Uh, those two structures, the thalamus and cortex, are interleaved with incredible density. And every region of cortex has its corresponding thalamic nucleus. But the word nucleus is quite misleading because these nuclei are really layered structures. They're not nuts. Uh, that's what the original meaning of nucleus is a nut uh, that is round and it's compact and so on. And that is indeed how it looks to the naked eye, but under the microscope, the histology uh, emerges, that is to say the cellular structure emerges very beautifully, as we've known for a hundred years. And so then we can look at the layered structure, both of the thalamic nuclei and also of the corresponding pieces of cortex. So we talk about the corticothalamic system or the thalamocortical system as being the basis of conscious contents. I want to emphasize contents here 
because vision and uh, voluntary control and audition and so on are reflected in cortex and the corresponding uh, thalamic nuclei as well. Uh, and also, uh, that is not the control system for the state of consciousness. The states of consciousness, as you know, are controlled, controlled by small nuclei in, on, in the base of the brain. Some of them are on the brainstem, some of them are a little bit outside of the brainstem, but in any case, they are basal brain uh, neuromodulating nuclei, and they project. Uh, they spritz neural modulators to various parts of the brain, sometimes very quickly, uh, more commonly as we think about it, uh, to turn on and off the state of sleep, waking, dreaming. Uh, and on the left-hand side, uh, 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 below there, you see the awake EEG trace. On the right-hand side, you see the awake, uh, sorry, the REM uh, EEG trace, which looks identical to the waking case because they are both conscious states. And right in the middle, you see non REM sleep, the typical example being, or the strongest example at least, being deep sleep. And in deep sleep, we see those long delta waves uh, which involve uh, simultaneous uh, buzzing and pausing of billions of neurons so that when they simultaneously buzz, uh, the delta wave sweeps upward, and when they simultaneously pause, the delta wave sweeps downward and we get a trough, so that during the uh, down cycle of the delta wave, uh, processing is blocked in the corticothalamic system. And during the up uh, uh, wave, uh, it is permitted, and uh, beautiful work by Massimini and Tononi and Rosanova and Stephen Lawrence and others uh, now shows that, uh, that in fact the cortex is something like awake uh, during the peak of the delta wave. Uh, very interesting work. I'm not going to talk about it here, but uh, do look it up if you're interested in that. Next slide, please. Uh, slide number 14. Uh, this is a beautiful illustration of the corticothalamic system, and as you can see uh, quite nicely here, uh, uh, in this particular case, we're looking at uh, projections that look like they're coming from somewhere deep in the corticothalamic system and projecting upward. Uh, the corticothalamic system, of course, the cells uh, of it, of the cortex uh, are sitting on the outside. They're just about a millimeter or two or three thick uh, in terms of the actual cellular layers. And the rest is white matter, uh, axons with myelination around it that uh, fill a huge amount of the volume of our very large brains. And these colored uh, axons that you see here uh, should really be white uh, but they are shown in color just to indicate uh, the different uh, uh, tracts uh, of the corticothalamic system, hugely interconnected system, which is what differentiates it from other parts of the brain. And this is from a very nice uh, biologically faithful simulation by Ijikevich and Edelman, published in uh, PNAS uh, in 2008. Slide number 15, please. Uh, well, brains are massively parallel biocomputers or societies of biocomputers. And we now know that the wave, waves that have been observed since 1929, since the invention of the EEG by Hans Berger, uh, that those waves are functional. That's another story, and I can't prove that right here, but um, uh, it is now generally believed. Uh, and of course, there are people at this conference, like Wolf Singer, for example, who were onto that way back when, uh, just like there are people at this conference who have done many, many important things. Uh, uh, we have some wonderful scientists uh, at this conference, and I'm grateful to have them. Uh, so this is very uh, cool. Um, uh, image emerging out of this. The red dots in this uh, 
a simulation of the brain based on biologically faithful neurons, um, uh, the simulation of the cortical thalamic system, I should say. Um, the, the, uh, the red dots are excitatory neurons. The black dots, which are a little hard to see, are inhibitory neurons. When you put them all together, you get these emergent waveforms at the mesoscopic or macroscopic level uh, of the brain, which is quite stunning. Uh, and you can uh, download a little video from this article, uh, and I would highly recommend uh, just playing that little video and looking at it and watching the surf waves emerge from a simulation that has been programmed only at the level of single neurons or interactions between neurons as well, of course. So, um, so this is an extraordinary uh, piece of simulation, I think. So what we have here is a hypothesis that the conscious objects of experiences uh, are associated with momentary broadcasts in the wave medium of the TC core. And the notion that this is a wave medium uh, is, um, was verified by animal neurophysiologists, people like uh, Mircea Styriad, who has a wonderful article in 2006 uh, that discusses this and that proposes indeed that the cortical thalamic system uh, should be considered to be a coherent wave medium. Now that's not the only kind of code that the cortical thalamic system uses, but it's a major a source of, uh, of coding schemes. Now, uh, we know um, uh, from a variety of wonderful studies using tractography, but also from traditional anatomical studies, uh, that, um, uh, that the cortical thalamic system uh, has many, many different hubs and many, many different highways. Uh, and the, the actual work on that has been done recently by Ashard, by a number of other people, uh, indicating that small wor world mathematics apply to the cortical thalamic system, at least to some uh, within certain scales. Uh, and uh, in that particular case, uh, that means that there are many different hubs, and since a global workspace involves a hub, uh, that suggests that uh, the global workspace uh, should be sought, or the global workspace underlying consciousness should be sought in a dynamically linked hubs that could bind a coherent gestalt, coherent content of consciousness, and then broadcast it to the rest. Uh, the argument here is that we are not talking about a single anatomical hub, but rather a, a dynamic hub. Uh, slide 18, please. Um, and here is a nice way of um, showing it. You can see the orientation of the head here to pointing to the left. Uh, this is the extent of my drawing capability. And if anybody can do a better job, please do so and let me know about it. The, there are a number of different hypotheses about different uh, parts of the cortex uh, performing as hubs or at least as components of consciousness. Uh, I'm going to talk about four of them. Uh, on the left hand side uh, we have the cortex but in particular we have the prefrontal cortex. Uh, a little bit on the top uh, right hand side we have area V1, the first visual area of the cortical stream of visual regions. Uh, on the one notch below that, we have area IT in humans, and which is the bottom of the temporal lobe, the inferotemporal cortex, and therefore area IT, which is known to be involved in object representation. And on the very bottom, we have a very controversial part of the hypothesis, which is uh, whether um, MTL, the medial temporal lobe and hippocampus, may also be involved in uh, conscious contents. Uh, and uh, we have people who have made specific proposals, in particular, Dahan and Changer. This is a slide 19, I should say, 
uh, slide 19, uh, Dahan and Changeur uh, have proposed that the prefrontal cortex is involved, uh, is the global workspace uh, for the brain, and there's indeed evidence for that, but particularly for feelings of effort in the early work from Dahan and Changeur. Um, Zeki and Lame have argued that early visual cortex is the basis of at least visual cortex, uh, visual consciousness. Um, Logothetis et al. have provided very beautiful evidence based on uh, binocular rivalry in the macaque uh, that area IT, the infratemporal cortex in humans, um, uh, is the place where it all comes together, basically, so that 90% of the neurons respond to the conscious input, but not to the matched unconscious input. Uh, this is work in monkeys, where this area is called TE rather than IT, uh, but I'm going to call it IT. Uh, and then nobody, well, that's not quite true. Some people have proposed that MTL and hippocampus might also uh, support conscious contents. Uh, and the reason for skepticism on that today is that HM had normal seeming consciousness, and HM, of course, did not have hippocampi. He's the famous surgical patient uh, from 1950-something, I think, uh, when he had his bilateral excision of the medial temporal lobe, which includes the two hippocampi and amygdalas as well, uh, so that uh, this is taken to be uh, strong evidence uh, that uh, the hippocampi are at least not necessary for consciousness. Uh, but in any case, uh, I believe that they could participate in consciousness in healthy people who do have an intact MTL, and I will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next slide is number 20, uh, and this is a prediction from Global Workspace Dynamics, uh, which is that conscious contents can emerge anywhere in the CT core, depending upon stimulus and task conditions. So I think that the Han and Changer were right about the prefrontal cortex, but only for certain kinds of contents, conscious contents. Uh, Zeki, I believe, was right about V3, V4. Lame is right about early visual cortex. Logothesis and all were right about um, visual objects. Um, and I believe that um, uh, there are one or two people who have argued that MTL and the hippocampus, uh, uh, and I think that uh, that involves um, episodes, conscious episodes. So uh, the argument here is that any of these four regions can both bind, integrate multiple sources of neuronal signaling uh, and broadcast them widely to other regions of cortex and subcortex as well, such as the cerebellum, basal ganglia, and even the brainstem. Uh, this is in humans. Uh, in other creatures, of course, there may be other structures involved in, the, uh, in supporting conscious contents. And that is a, a very live question right now, and I believe Bjorn Merker will make that case at this conference. Uh, so, uh, so the claim here is uh, on slide 22, that the prefrontal cortex uh, is gives us feelings of knowing, which are very, very important. As William James pointed out in 1890, he called them fringe conscious experiences. And the most famous example is the tip of the tongue experience. Uh, I also would suggest that early visual cortex is uh, just right for perceiving a single bright star on a dark night, that is to say, a single bright point in a dark, uh, lightless surround, because V1 has a high resolution visual maps uh, that are perfect for that. It can distinguish between dark and light. Uh, it, um, uh, it does not um, do higher level analysis, although it can participate in higher level analysis from higher uh, visual topical maps of the visual system. 
Uh, and then uh, it, when we want to see a coffee cup on a table within body space, uh, we use IT, uh, and indeed we also use the dorsal stream, which is not shown here, uh, but the dorsal stream and the ventral stream interact with each other in order to be able to see visual objects. Uh, and it's been argued by Shimamura that uh, indeed those two, that the dorsal and ventral stream join uh, in the MTL. Uh, and that's an interesting hypothesis. And it certainly uh, fits uh, the global workspace uh, uh, orientation uh, that I've developed since 1980, roughly. Uh, so, uh, so, and finally, uh, so the conscious episodes, whole episodes, events, uh, uh, causality, um, the uh, scenes, um, interactions perhaps between human beings, but relatively short event scenarios. Um, which are conscious, uh, are encoded, I would suggest, in the MTL, uh, IT as well, and uh, even new regions that are newly discovered uh, to have a role in these kinds of things, just as, such as the lateral occipital cortex. Uh, there are always uh, multiple visual topical maps that work together, by the way. So that uh, I don't mean to say that uh, if there's a starburst uh, s a sign in IT, for example, I don't mean to rule out the participation of the other areas, but there's kind of a center of gravity of activity that occurs in IT. Here's a very pretty study. Uh, this is slide 25 from Sam Duisberg and colleagues, including Lawrence Ward, uh, called Large Scale Gamma Band Phase Synchronization and Selective Attention in Cerebral Cortex uh, a few years ago. I actually don't have the, oh, 2007, yes. A very, very pretty study, uh, just uh, asking people to attend to an LED in, on the left side of visual space, and then to attend to an LED, flashing LED probably on the right-hand side of visual space. And as we know, uh, there's contralateral projections or contralateral streaming of the signal. Uh, that happens in such cases when we look at the lateral halves of each hemifield or hemi retina. Uh, and so in this particular case, since we're looking at the left visual cue, uh, this crosses, the left side crosses over to the right hand side, the right side stays on the right hand side, they jointly activate the area V1 and upward, of the visual cortex uh, so that the right hemisphere in this particular case is the first one to pick up the visual stimulus and Duisberg et al found that you get this beautiful burst of activity uh, from emerging from the right hemisphere visual cortex however it goes right across the corpus callosum because there's 200 million fibers there or 100 million at least uh, so at time t equals 300 milliseconds, uh, you get a broadcast burst, basically, uh, from, uh, from the right-hand uh, visual cortex. And by that time, it may already have gotten to IT and even to MTL. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, there's also a, another extraordinary study, very sophisticated Potato study. Clock. Uh, and this is uh, number uh, 26, slide number 26. Uh, extraordinary study by Gaillard, Han, and colleagues in PLOS One in 2009. Beautiful study using Granger analysis to pull out um, causal relationships in uh, time series. Uh, and this uh, shows what uh, Dahan calls the ignition, which I would call the global broadcast. Um, although it's not clear necessarily right now based on the evidence that we can tell the difference between the binding component of the global workspace 
uh, and the broadcast component of the global workspace. Uh, and this one shows uh, a number of different uh, 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 events, uh, um, signaling events. Uh, uh, the, uh, the dark colors are the increases and also decreases, by the way, because we have information processing going on. It's not all uh, increases of activation because that would be not functional. Uh, in order to do this functionally, you have to identify the stimulus, and some levels of the stimulus uh, become emphasized and others become inhibited. So in this particular case, Gayar and company um, found gamma coherence increase for conscious versus unconscious stimuli, broadcasting from the occipital to the temporal, parietal, and I should add uh, frontal regions. You know, there's a little bit of frontal stuff going on. There usually is. It uh, depends upon the amount of time. Um, and here's a, another uh, beautiful series of experiments by Antti Revonsuo in Finland and uh, his um, several um, uh, former students who are now running their own studies uh, using the event-related potential and uh, Antti and um, and his co-workers have discovered uh, what they call a visual awareness negativity, the VAN, um, uh, about uh, almost 300 milliseconds uh, after the onset of the stimulus. It is considered to be roughly a component uh, of the P3B wave, the P3B wave, which has a particular meaning, uh, and you can just uh, look that up. Uh, and then there is uh, also an LP uh, component, uh, the late positive difference, which uh, occurs uh, between 4 and 500 millisecond post stimulus. What is interesting about these uh, waveforms is that they occur only in the conscious case and not in the comparison case that is unconscious. So we know that it is, it is um, uh, linked to consciousness and this kind of result has been replicated now oh, maybe a dozen times, uh, so it's a good solid result. Um, and since it's coming from visual cortex, I would argue, and since it's probably a simple stimuli, uh, we're, we're expecting this to involve early visual cortex, and which is roughly what we see here uh, in terms of the activity um, wave that, um, that is moving forward. So here's the hypothesis again. This is global workspace dynamics as of today in 2012. And the prediction is that conscious contents can emerge anywhere in the cortical thalamic core, depending upon stimulus and task conditions, including the prefrontal cortex, for feelings of knowing, tip of the tongue, a sense of effort, and many other things which are very, very important, by the way. Uh, and, for example, the sense of mental effort is strongly associated with the G component uh, of the intelligence test. Uh, I'm also claiming that MTL uh, and hippocampus uh, are involved in consciousness in people with intact brains, but that in the case of HM, what we got uh, was a replacement of function and dynamic reorganization, which we know happens with uh, severe uh, cortical surgery uh, quite on quite a routine basis. So HM, uh, who's a wonderful subject, has been studied many, many times in very careful ways over a 50-year period or longer, uh, and who did recently died, uh, HM in slide 28 um, uh, could still have spared consciousness because most of his neocortex, uh, almost all of his neocortex, was spared. Uh, so he still had the capacity for conscious contents in these other regions of the brain. Uh, if he had been very carefully studied with precisely the right questions, it's possible that he might have been shown to have problems with event boundaries, for example. Uh, but you can only study what you can study at a time, and then later on you may find out different things. 
And finally, uh, the last slide, number 29, the details on this theoretical work can be found in the 1988 book from Cambridge University Press, uh, which is now on Amazon Kindle because I wanted to make it available to as many uh, people as possible. Uh, for $10, you can get the original uh, Cognitive Theory of Consciousness which lays out all the hypotheses, uh, has the glossary that still applies. The one thing that's lacking in that book, most conspicuously, uh, is the brain evidence, because we didn't have the brain evidence in 1988. Uh, so that is uh, laid out uh, in the greatest amount of detail with the largest number of references in my second textbook. The first one was more advanced. This one is more fundamental with Nicole Gage, Bars and Gage, Fundamentals of Cognitive Neuroscience, a Beginner's Guide, and I would particularly call your attention to chapter 8, the chapter on consciousness and attention, which provides a huge amount of evidence for the framework that I'm discussing here. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, if only uh, via computer and web, uh, but uh, I, I think that Stephen and his colleagues have done an extraordinary job. Uh, this is uh, an extremely high-level conference, and uh, obviously the ASSC is meeting simultaneously in Brighton, in the UK, which is another wonderful event. We have made great progress in uh, both empirically and in communicating with each other in the last uh, 20 years, 30 years, uh, I guess. Uh, so I congratulate you all on that. And the students who are here are lucky to be getting uh, the best people in the world to uh, uh, talk to and to, to, uh, to hear from. Uh, so thank you all for your attention, and uh, uh, I have many people to thank, far more people than I can mention here. I hope to have that opportunity perhaps later on at the conference. Thank you. Bye-bye.